So, hmm? Back oh yeah, I just got it. Okay. <laughs> I'm back recording. Uh, as long as you just take the waterfront, you're fine. Yeah. So, um, but anyways, the the idea that you have all these different teachings that people are coming up with, and then what people say is, if you don't follow this teaching, you can't be a part of this group. So what ends up happening is, whatever the whoever the leader of the group is. That is the final say in their, in their group, you get it? But among Hebrews, that's not the case. What they're teaching is unbiblical. Hebrews have one king, Yahuwah, who has shown himself to us, manifested in the flesh as Yehoshua. He reigns as king of kings, and master of all masters which means no leader has the right to claim my word in this group is final no you are only a first among equal period among us even if you were a king in Israel that was actually in the bloodline of David you were responsible to keeping Torah and anybody at any time could call you on it. It didn't matter who it was. And we could go from King Saul, because remember that um, Samuel came to him and was like, uh, what are you doing? He was like, man, I'm obeying, you know. I just figured, you know, I did it, but the people, they wanted the good stuff. He was like, dude, you tripping. Why? Because among our people, the, ching, the king could be put in check. The king could be brought on charges of breaking Torah. So therefore, and I could use David and Ahab, remember when he took Naboth's vineyard? Mm -hmm. And the um, even Naboth, when he asked for the vineyard, when, when, when Ahab asked for the vineyard, Na Naboth said, what are you talking about? Ain't nobody ever done this in Israel. In other words, king, you know you had a lie. So anybody could check anybody, even if you were the king. The king, on purpose, was from among the brethren, which meant that we were first among equals. So if my brother is the king, you know I'm going to be talking to him, right, if he does something stupid. Why? He's my brother. But, in a, but the way people are setting up camps today, they're making every Hebrew group servant to the teaching of that particular group's leader. So therefore, the leader is never brought on the carpet for their beliefs. And if they're leading Israel astray, then unfortunately, Israel suffers behind it. Because not only does the deceived, is the deceiver punished, but also the deceived. And let me just go online. Let me just put this out worldwide. Might as well do it now. If you don't believe that Yah was in your Hoshua reconciling the world back to himself, you're going to hell. There ain't no if and buts about it. We have a king. And the idea that you, that people are trying to create doctrine on the fly. They wake up one day and go, oh, I think this. And then teach other people to do it is against the Torah. All right, let's look at let's look at uh, Matthew chapter five. Oh, by the way, on the other side of the coin, you have the Christian churches, who they don't teach Torah at all. As a matter of fact, they believe that the whole purpose for the coming of the King was to get rid of Torah. And so I, I titled this little message. Oh, it's gonna rain a little bit, huh? Okay, we're good. It's Trinidad, man. Hey, I'm good. I want to talk about why Yehoshua came in his own words. In his own words. So that's the, the subject of this. Of this type of this lesson. You good? <laughs> oh, 
Uh oh, might get bad. Oh, they're prepared. <laughs> What did our king say in his own words? We don't have to let someone interpret it for us when we can read it for ourselves. How many of you all been following the, uh, the series we've been doing in, in Matthew? Have you seen any of the lessons we've taught in Matthew? You haven't, but you have? Okay, some have, some haven't. So, We've already gone through the teachings that the master did in his introduction to the message, which is what most people know as the Sermon on the Mountain. Now, the uh, way it begins is by way of introduction. Those are what people called in church the Beatitudes. And the, the reality is... Uh, <laughs> so what they um, what people call the Beatitudes in in Hebrew is actually would be it would actually be called the way of life it's the way to walk or the way of Yah so the idea of blessed has to do with a way a travel a path it's, it does not mean necessarily getting things so the blessed man is not the one who just always gets stuff. The blessed man is the one who's on the right path. There's two words for blessed. We don't have to do that today. But just know that all of those, all what they call like blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, all of those means the one that's right, the one that's on the path has these particular attitudes and attributes connected to them. Then we are told at the end that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world now this is coming from the mouth of our king and if you haven't seen that video you should maybe want to go back and check that out because there I talk uh, or bring out in the scripture how Yah has on purpose called us to be visible and even when we don't try to shine we shine that's why we are told to let our light so shine that men see our good works. Why? Because they're gonna see you regardless. You are the menorah of Yah. And he's going to always be walking among his candlestick. So therefore you should let your light as a menorah shine in a positive way so that they will see your good work and glorify Yah who's in heaven and not necessarily you. Do you get it? Okay, so this is an that's the introduction to the message. Now, before he actually starts to preach the message, he gives an intro, another introductory statement which is going to be his launching pad for everything else he says. And it's right here in this text. It says in verse 17, in English, think not. That simply means, don't ever think this, right? <laughs> that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Yeah. So let's look at this Hebraically. Let's look at this passage from the Hebrew mindset. The Bible was not written by Greeks. 
And, and um, I'm not into color, but the Greeks were primarily the white people of those days. They were the descendants of Yefeh. Yefeh lived in the north, in the what you call today Europe, while Shem and Ham stayed in Africa. Shem is our, is our ancestor. The Bible was written in Hebrew for the Hebrews. When Japheth came among the Hebrews, he did not know the culture of the Africans that wrote the Bible. He only knew his culture. And so therefore, he interpreted our scripture through his lens. Do you, do you get that? That he read it and went, oh, based on the way I think, this must be what he means here. So in this passage, we're going to discover some things Hebraically that does not line up at all with what we're going to find out. What Yeshua says here does not line up with what most white Europeans think he said in this passage. What he says here is very, very Hebraic. So I want to break down some Hebrew words. That's why I'm glad you all came out. You brought your Bible. You got your pens, pencils, and all that. Uh, I'm going to try to go kind of fast because I want um, to give time for questions and answers at the end. But, of course, anytime you want to ask a question while I'm teaching, feel free to do that. All right. So the first word in that first verse where it says, think not, the first word I want you to see is the word for not. And what'd you say? Angel. Yeah. Um, um, Aleph Lamet. And when you see that word, it means um, sometimes it is, it, it means the opposite. Or it could be like whatever he's getting ready to say, he's like, absolutely do not do this. So. The idea of, so then the emphasis is not on the not, it's on think. Absolutely don't do what? Don't think? No. He wants you to think. There's something that he does not want you to be thinking about. He doesn't even want this thought to come into your brain, into your mind. The Greek word for think is the word nomizo. And... That word to the Greeks means more than just thinking with your mind. It has to do with custom. That which becomes a part of life. That which, it's how you use it. Like for instance, the Bible says, as a man thinks, so is he. So this word here um, in the Greek means to hold something as true or to hold something that then alters the way I live or controls the way I live. So even the Greek word behind this English word think has to do with rule, R-U-L-E. Because what the king is gonna say is, your rule of life cannot be what you think it is right now. And that is that I've come to destroy the law. But before we get there, let's understand that there's another word for, uh, in the Hebrew, there's several words for think, and I'm just going to give them to you. I'll spell them, give you the definition, and then we will discuss them a little bit later. The first word I want you to write down is the word devar. Do you want it in Hebrew or English? Both? <laughs> okay. So devar in Hebrew would be dale. I'm sorry, Dalit, Bet, Resh. And maybe Ulo could put it up. In English, D A V A R. You know, the Bet takes on the soft the sound when it's in the middle of a word. Okay? The basic understanding of Devar, meaning speech or word, See, 
Now we would use the word think, but here it's speech or word or command, promise. I'm giving these words fast, I know. But I want you to see that it has to do with an arrangement. An arrangement or a placing of something. That's devar. Orderly arrangement or placement. Why? Because devar is going to deal with, thank you, devar is going to deal with patterns. Because your thinking creates patterns. And if you think a certain way, you're going to then pattern your life after that. So the word devar actually means word. Second word for think here is the word dot. D A T in English, dalit tav in Hebrew. Dalit tav in Hebrew. This word, this word dot, dalit tav, is related to nomos or namos in in um, Greek, which is related to our word for law. And it is a decree or a judgment. Now, what's interesting about that word is it's connected literally to um, what you would call being something being regulated. Something that has boundaries put on it. So when a person, say, makes a law or makes a decree, then it is taken that you are now supposed to operate within those boundaries. The third related word, and I'm going to give you a little more detail on this word, is chalk. It would be spelled chet kof in Hebrew, and we would spell it, I don't even know how to spell it in English, C-H-O-Q, would that work? Yeah, <laughs> Okay, um, I think I guessed on that one, and <laughs> the, it is, the idea again is statute or ordinance, and again it limits, it's the idea of limitation. So. This word, the nuance that it carries when we talk about think, it has to do with a personal resolution for a person to come to a resolve on their own. Like, I've looked at this and I've resolved that this is the fact. And therefore, I'm going to live like this. So you, you see how they kind of, you got a rule of your life, but everything this, that this word think has is going to be connected to law. It's going to be connected to a particular boundary or a decree. Um, so when we look at the het, Hula dealt with this earlier. The het, well, she dealt with the, yeah, she dealt with the het from here. The het is a tent wall or a wall of separation. And Kuf is a picture of the sun on the horizon, and it represents the idea of coming together. So, so the word, when you put them together, it means separate, separation and coming together. I know that sounds confusing. Separation and coming together is our English word for custom or tradition. It is our separating and the things that we do that are separate from everybody else that draws us together as a people. Okay, put it back in the sentence. Think not that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. So if you think he's come to destroy the law and the prophets, then you're going to gather with people who also believe he's come 
to destroy the law and the prophets. Why? Because that then will become your tradition, it will become your custom, it will become your culture. So that word there is related to this Greek word again because your culture, watch this, becomes your rule of life. If you think that the king came to do away with the law and the prophets, you will start living as though those laws and the prophets are done away with. It will become your culture. It will become your custom. It will become your function. And it will become your duty. That's why when you tell people, no, y'all didn't destroy the law, they feel like it's their duty to straighten you out. They feel like it's their responsibility to pull you to the side and say, look, young man, listen to me, young woman. Why? Because, because that word literally means we're separated and made special or made a people by our customs. Now, the last word is the one most likely used here because there's more. I'm just going to give you one more. This is the word most likely used here, and it's, and it's the word mitzvah. Oh, no, I'm going to give you two more. Let me give you mitzvah first. I'm still dealing with this idea of thinking. So, you know, mitzvah is the, is the Hebrew word for law or command or precept. So once again, we have all these words that English says think. But all of the words in Hebrew have to do with either law, judgment, custom, um, role, ordinance, precepts. Why? Because as a person creates law in their mind, that's the law they live by in their body. Okay, so the word, the word, most likely behind this Greek word here is our word for Torah and that will be spelled in English T O R A H the root of that word is simply Tav Resh what is a Tav? Yeah, mark, a sign, of the crossing of two sticks together, which makes a mark. What is the resh? Head of a Yes, it's the head. So literally, that word is the mark of a man. The mark of a man had to do with a man's borders. If you were given land and you had borders, that was your mark. If we have a term, I don't know if you have it out, out here, but in America, they say, you want to make your mark in the world. That means you want to leave something, some kind of imprint, you want to leave something when you're gone. So that thing, that whatever you leave here, it was considered that part of you that was under your own control. So, while we have the instruction side of Torah, every human has Torah inside of him. There's a part of you that you control. Somebody says, no, man, I'm out of control. No, you're doing exactly what you want to do. Now that flies in the face of everything they're teaching us now that no, you're a victim of this, of that, of this, and that. And I'm not saying that we haven't had rough times, but the way Yah looks at a human is that he has, or she has, an inner voice that tells them what to do and tells them what to think. So we are constantly told in scripture to bring that man under subjection so that we are no longer 
thinking according to the to our own mark but we should be thinking according to his mark of course torah is his mark on us that's we know that later we'll discover that so so watch this the messiah is saying i don't ever want you to even let it for a moment come into your thought processes so that it will begin to be a law in your life that I came here to do to destroy the law I don't want that thought to ever even come up in conversation I don't want it to affect your behavior I don't want you to I don't I don't I don't want it to become a law I don't want it to become a boundary I don't want it to become a marker I don't want that thought in you at all. Matter of fact, I don't even want you to think at, at any time that I came here, now watch this, to, and, the, and I think the English word is destroy, right? He said, don't think that I've, I've come to destroy. Oh, before we get there, let me do this word. I have come, write that down. So he's telling us what not to think. Now he's telling us this phrase, I have come. In Greek, it's, it's, it is um, erkomahi. And, and erkomahi simply means in, in Greek to come from one place to another. And so while that does while that is what he says, Hebrew has a deeper understanding of that. Erkamai simply means if a person just moves from one place to another, then that's, that's him coming. But when he said that, he used a different word. Who would already know where I'm going with this? He used the word teshuva or shuv. S-H-U-V in English is the root word. Shin, bet, in Hebrew and that word literally means turn or seat in Hebrew it means turn or it could be or it could mean seat now I know you're thinking how is that the case shin does anyone know what the shin represents in Hebrew it's on your it's on your download if you have it. Ah, uh, yes. What's the picture? What's the picture of a shin? Two front teeth. Excellent. Two front teeth. To eat something, a person presses down with their front teeth. Right? Especially if they're really hungry. <laughs> they go, they're eating, right? And so you have the idea to press. The bet is what? Huh? Is a house or a tent. And so therefore, when you combine the two letters together, you have press toward the tent or press toward the house. Why? Because as a person is gone away, when he comes back, especially if it's a long journey, the closer he gets to the house, the more excited or the more anxious he is to get there so he could go inside and sit down. So if it's the man of the house and he's been working all day, when the sun starts going down and he's tired, what he wants to do is he wants to enter, press toward his own dome door of his tent and go inside the bed and sit down and relax. Or here's a, here's a word, he takes his proper place. So how many of you all have the fortunate fortunate experience if you did of having a father or a grandfather who actually had a job or worked and provided for the family raise your hand okay if you did then you will know most of the time dad or grandpa had his seat so if you was a kid in the house and you was in his seat right you know why you're agreeing, right? Because we still do it. It's still in our culture to this day. So when when daddy come home, if you're still in his seat, he may say something, he may not. But if he look at you, you already know. Get out of daddy's seat. 
Now, mama, she might run interference and be like, baby, get up. Daddy's home and you in his seat. Why? Because that is a part of the culture. He work hard all day, wants to come press toward the house and take his seat. And when he's at that seat, he's sitting in the seat of authority. Please write that down. It is the seat of authority here in this passage. So, what is implied in this word then is not just a going from one place to another, as the Greek says, but watch this. What's implied is a returning home. So now listen to what the Messiah says, what our King says. Don't think that I've come back here. Come back here? Yeah. His, his showing up on the planet was a returning to his own house. He came unto his own. And his family didn't even know him. Yah established the Hebrew Israelite nation. It's his nation. And it was him that said, when you do this, I'll dwell. Do this, I'll dwell. But you act, uh, I'm out. Do this, I'll dwell. As a matter of fact, there was a time during, the, during our judges that we were so wicked that one of, the, one of our women literally had a baby in name of Ichabod to represent that the spirit of Yah or the anointing or the glory of Yah had departed. A nation without his king. So when Yeshua says, Think not that I have come. The word that he used to the Hebrew mind was Shu. Don't think that I've come back here to dwell and to sit here to teach, to take my proper seat. Watch this. Now he puts to destroy the law and prophet. Without giving you the spoil of the whole message where I'm going, he is the lawgiver. So just to get that out quickly, he is the one who gave the law to Moses. He is the one who met Moses in the cliff of the rock. He's the one who met um, uh, Joshua, before he went to Jericho, stand on the mountain, the captain of Yahuwah's host or army. And I can go on and on with that. But here's my point. Yisrael, the Bet, the house of Israel, watch this, is his house. Remember when he went in the temple, Yeshua, and he's saw everybody selling like trinkets and sheep and oxen and goats. He went to tear, turning over tables and stuff and they was like, man, who gives you the authority to do that? He like, it's written. My house. No, where's your authority come from? It's my house. And while I was gone, y'all took my house and turned it into a den of thieves. And there's another passage, passage in scripture where he got that from where it says, for the zeal of his house has eaten him up. His coming was a return. It was him showing up in his house in the flesh. So, <clears throat> he not only comes to the house, but he takes a seat I didn't, want to have, I didn't want to have to get this deep. But when you read Luke, you're going to discover that Yeshua, Yehoshua, went to the synagogue on the Shabbat. And they asked him to read. 
So he took the scroll, opened it <laughs> to the passage in Isaiah. And, and, it was, and, and when he opened it, it, it read, the spirit of Yah is upon me. For he has anointed me to preach the gospel. Y'all heard that. To heal the broken heart, set at liberty those that are captives, and um, set at liberty those that are bound. Uh, to recover sight to the blind and to preach the acceptable year of Yahuwah, right? But the Bible says and after he did that He rolled up the scroll And he took a seat or he sat in the seat and most people who don't know Hebrew don't understand That they kept in the synagogue a seat that was reserved only For the Messiah For the return of the king because Isaiah prophesies the return of Yah to his people. So what he does when he finishes reading it, he sits in that chair. <laughs> so he sat down, they was like, what the? <laughs> Yeshua never shied away from the fact that he was the king and that this was his house and he was coming back to set his house in order. All right, now let's continue. He said, don't think that I've come back to you to destroy the law. And that word of katalu in Greek, or kataluo in Greek, literally means to dissolve or disunite. But in Hebrew, it is labata. I think that's how you say it. It's lamet bet or labata. Lamet bet tav lamet. And how you say it? What did I say? Oh, sure is. Let me fix that. Tet. Yes. And the word literally means to abolish or to destroy. So, so he says, don't think, don't even let it come to your mind for one second. Don't let it rule your life. Don't let it become a custom. Don't let it become a law. Don't ever think that I've come to abolish or to do away with or to destroy thank you for that appreciate it um, the law and again that word nomos nomos in Greek N -O -N -O -M -O -S. now in Greek the word nomos represents anything that's established law but in Hebrew the word is Torah so our law is not anything that's established as law. Our law is what Yah has established as law. He said, don't think that I've come to destroy any of that. No. It's the word Torah. It's the mark of a man. And it is the borders by which we, which we can, can control our lives. Our lives are controlled. We walk within the borders of Torah. We don't go outside that. <laughs> oh yeah, good idea. Yeah, the borders of your garment. Put the yeah, you put the seats on every corner. So Why to remind you? Yeah, that we don't do our own thing. We do His thing. We keep His laws and statutes. We were slaves in Egypt. He delivered us to then what? Walk according to His ways, which is Torah. He said, "I didn't come to destroy Torah." Why? Write this down. This is important. To destroy Torah makes him a false prophet. If he destroys Torah, he's a false prophet and must be stoned. So he knows how Hebrews are. We always looking for a new leader to give, come up with something new. So you know they like, man. We under these burdens and all this stuff, right? And then the Messiah comes and they're like, oh, he gonna come with some new laws. He's like, ah, I don't think that. He says, now, I'm not coming up with nothing new because I'm not gonna destroy the old. He says, but what I am going to do is fulfill them. Simple word in English, flip it around, feel full. You're gonna be close to the Hebrew definition. Fulfill, let's flip the word around, Fill till it's full. 
So the Hebrew word there, malah, simply means accomplish. It means to accomplish. It means to be, <coughs> wow, this is kind of deep. I don't know if I'm going to deep, but it means to be armed or to satisfy. It's the idea of battle. If you're on a battlefield and you've got a, the enemy coming and you don't have enough weapons, you'd be like, damn, <laughs> we in trouble. But when you hear of reinforcements, then every every place you thought you were going to be defeated or, or every battle you thought you were going to lose, when you saw the cavalry and all the reinforcements coming, all of a sudden you get excited. Why? Because they're going to fill that void of the lack of ammunition. They're going to fill that void in order to accomplish the task, which is to win the battle. He's saying, I'm coming bringing the big guns. We're going to win. I didn't come to do away with it. I actually came to confirm everything. So <clears throat> let me give you this word, a definition. It's the idea of continue. As I mentioned in my introduction, that a lot of the people say he came to destroy the law or do away with the law, but it's the exact opposite of what he says. He said, don't think I came to do that. He really came to continue it. That it may continue, but, but the idea is I need to continue it because you all have put holes in it. So I need to fill the gaps. You all have twisted it. I got to untwist what y'all twisted. You guys have taken stuff away. I got to put it back. You guys have added stuff. I got to take that off. Why? Because I am the one that's going to create the perfect chain of words to complete the sentence of Yah. I'm going to make it perfect from the beginning to the end. That's why I've come. Can I say it like this? I'm the missing link in the chain. It ain't never going to be right until I am put in it. Now, knowing that, you can see how from this verse forward, when he gets into like verse 20, he's going to start talking about what you've heard and what I say. What you've heard and what I say. Why? Because once he establishes the fact that I'm the one with the final say, now I'm going to start immediately putting things in their proper order. Well, you're sure. How do you know the proper order? I wrote it. It's mine. You think Moses gave you the law. But if you read Moses, Moses said, these ain't my people. <laughs> Did I have all these kids? These your babies. And they running me nuts. So Moses never claimed to be the one given Yisrael the laws. As a matter of fact, he took the exact opposite. He said, these are the, Yah, the laws of Yah. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. So therefore, we don't see a destruction or dissolving of the law. We see a establishing of it. Um, as a matter of fact, without the Messiah, without our King Yoshua, the law does not make sense. And this is why I challenge, and I still do it to this day, I challenge every conscious Hebrew to really examine how could you be Hebrew and not Messianic? Because the whole idea of being a Hebrew is based on Messiah. Messiah is not an afterthought of Yah. 
He was, according to scriptures, the Lamb of Yah slain before the foundation of the world. As a matter of fact, you can't get out of Genesis chapter 3 without seeing a type. Well, actually, you can't get out of Genesis 1, but I ain't going to go that. Because really, when you talk about light and Yah said, as soon as he spoke, it became the word, the word. So, But my point is, when we actually see, we start seeing the Messiah, the symbolism of a mediator or go-between or someone that we need to fix things between us and Yah, we see it first in a in an innocent uh, animal, we know later there was a lamb, that was slain in the Garden of Eden to cover temporarily Adam and Eve, right? So how are you claiming to be Hebrew and don't believe in the covering? Because Hebrew, you can't cover yourself. This is my brother over here say you're going to try to get to Cali? Hey, I'm going to be back to back with you, man. But when it comes to the king, when the throne, when we get up there before the king, man, hey, I I can't cover you, bro. You on your own, I'm on my own. <laughs> we better have the blood of the root. You better have uh, your Hoshua as your covering. Now, I'm not going to get too much deeper into that. I just want you to understand that take him out and it make and the whole Bible falls apart. It, it it shreds. There's no purpose and reason for anything if we don't have a king. All right. Now Yeshua is our chain, is our is our link in the chain, or he's the one who fixes it so that everything runs smooth, so that it, there is an uninterrupted flow from the first word of the scriptures to the last word. Once he's in the mix, everything makes sense all the way through. Take him out and nothing makes sense. Put him in, watch this, you have a high. Take him out, you get 41,000 different denominations. Put him in, one. I'm the way, the truth, the life. Take him out. Now you got this sect over here and this sect over here and, and everybody doing what they want to do. Why? Because the king is not in. That's why he says, I'm here to make that connection. All right, let's keep going. Verse 18. You see the word says there. Wait, did we finish 17? Let me make sure. All right. Read 18 for me. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one judge for one citizen shall in no wise pass from the Lord. The word there to all be fulfilled. Yeah. Now, the word there for truly is Aman. She dealt with that word earlier. It's Aman, and it comes from the uh, parent root, which is just simply Mem Nun. And it does mean the motion or the flowing of the seed, which has to do with. Uh, water, motion, seed, put it together, and you got the blood continues. <laughs> I love this. When you put this in the Hebraic, in the Hebraic uh, uh, context, which is supposed to be, literally he says, he says, don't think I've come to destroy the laws and the prophets. I'm continuing it. You don't, don't think I'm getting married. No. I am the continuation of it. You're looking at what it was talking about. I'm the seed, if you please. One of the things I was I used to always do is I, I have these, uh, I used to call them rundowns. I used to talk about our king and how he's everything. So he's the root and the fruit. He's the seed and the savior. He's the child and the king at the same time. He's the priest and the prophet, right? He himself is the sacrifice and the sacrificer. <laughs> so I can go on and on with that. But here we see what he's saying is, no, I can't destroy the law and the prophets. Why? Because I am a result of that. I am that. I put that in motion. And as strong as seed is from a father to a child, and we learn lately that that's a digital, um, DNA is digital. 
So that's, have you ever heard the, the term, apple don't fall too far from the tree, even in a strong wind? <laughs> Somebody look at you and say, well, you look like your daddy. You look like your mama, right? So the idea is saying, I can tell your bloodline by just looking at you. So, so that idea became surety. So this is what he said. I am the surety to the actual word. When he said truly, truly, he said, oh yeah, you can believe this. Now here's what he's saying. <clears throat> Until heaven and earth, right? Let me make sure I got that right. For very I said to you, till heaven and earth, heaven in Greek, Oranos. Even the Greeks interpreted heaven as a vaulted expanse, which simply means they knew that the earth sat on a flat plain and it was covered by a, by a vault or a vaulted expanse. So they didn't, this whole idea now that there's just some ozone layer around this ball that's moving, uh, moving a thousand miles, a thousand miles an hour, and spinning and all this kind of stuff. That is a new thought that's being put out there, um, and people are buying it because they buy evolution. But if you buy, if you want to be a Hebrew, then you got to know that we are not based on what's called a solar system. The sun with the soul, where they get the word S-O-L from, the sun was not created according to our Bible until day four. This world functioned from day one, day two, day three, day four without a sun because we had Yah's light. He made two great lights according to the scripture and put them in the sky. Put them in what's called the firmament which is our covering. Now, what is he saying with the word heaven? In Greek, the way they interpret it was the vaulted sky, because in their brain, that's, only, that's the only possible explanation it could be. But in Hebrew, the word is shamayim. And while it does mean the sky, it also means, watch this, the abode of Yah, the house of Yah, if you please, the abode of Yah. So when the king says heaven, he's not talking about just the expanse. He's talking about the shim. Shim is a word that we get our word breath from. Shin. Shim. Shim is where we get our word breath or win or name good job shim so shamayim is related to just write this down we won't go deep the shamayim is related to the witness of yah have you heard verses like the heavens declare the glory of yah okay so so the Shamaim witnesses. It is the, the Shamaim is the character of Yah. So what he's really saying is uh, until Yah's character is gone. Because he has written in the heavens. He's not just talking about just a regular sky. No, he's literally saying, I'm putting all of Yah's reputation on Torah. If Torah fails, ain't no Yah. That's what he's saying. When he says, till Shamaim, and now the next word for earth, we would think he would say Adama. That's not the word he used though. He used the word Haaretz. Haaretz so Adama means Adam, where we get the word for uh, soil. But Aretz means earth. So what's the difference between soil and earth? 
soil represents a particular piece of soil where earth represents the whole thing so he's saying not only will Yah and his reputation be completely gone it, well, we'll get to that in a minute because he's actually saying the opposite he's actually saying that it ain't getting ready to pass but he's also saying the whole earth now here's your definition for earth because it becomes idiomatic it becomes an idiom so when they say the whole earth what we're going to be dealing with is earth as a whole earth as opposed to heaven earth its inhabitants so earth as a whole earth as opposed to heaven earth and its inhabitants he's saying until yah and his reputation is gone the sky and his abode and his witness is gone watch this and the whole earth is gone which means you too and every one of you he says not one jot in english jot is from a greek word iota yah yeshua did not say iota it wouldn't make no sense he said yod or yod y-a-d Greek mind versus Hebrew mind. In the Greek mind, every commentary that you're going to ever pick up on this verse, they're going to say, the Yod is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And that's why it was used right here. Because he's trying to say it was the smallest letter. One Yod. Because Greeks think in terms of what? Form. That was never the thought in the mind of the Messiah when he said Yod. He's not thinking of small at all. As a matter of fact, he's thinking just the opposite. What is the Yod in scripture? Huh? Arm, hand, work, deed, might, power. So why do they tell you before one little stroke of the pen, and one little, because they got you thinking in terms of size, which is form and not function. The yod represents power, strength. Matter of fact, I want to stay here just for a moment. The word yod is arm and hand. So we're talking about the arm of Yah and the hand of Yah. The authority of Yah. And let me show you how this makes perfect sense. How it makes perfect sense. Go to Hebrews in your Bible, chapter 1, verse 3. And believe it or not, I'm almost done. Hallelujah. Go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And I want somebody to read that for me. And let's see if it's consistent now with what I've been telling you. Who got it? You have it, Joe? Who be in the brightness of mm -hmm. his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself put our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Do you see the phrase upholding all things by the word of his power? That's the Yod. Psalm 89, 13. Psalm number 89, verse 13. All over 
the world, Hebrews are getting understanding and insight on this scripture that they've never had before. And we give all praise and honor to the Most High Yah. Psalm 89, verse 13. What does it say? Thou hast a mighty arm. Come on. Strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. I need somebody else to read that because you think I paid him to read that and I didn't. Anybody else got that verse? Read it loud. The house of what? No, very small. Because the because they said yo here is the smallest thing. That's not what he said. What did he say? You have a mighty, come on. Wait, no. Weak and small is thy hand. Strong. No, he got a strong hand. And high is thy right. So, do you understand Zion when he says not one yod of the word? Because yod is a powerful letter, but meaning in Hebrew. Here it is. Number 10 in Hebrew. It has the idea, it, it, I'm sorry, it's the 10th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it has the idea of energy or power. The number 10 has to do with power or energy or even a point of energy. Very important. The point of energy the point of power means everything starts with the yod. Say, huh? Because I'm going to show you what he's really saying here. I'm just going to give you a spoiler alert. What he's actually saying is, yah, from start to finish, is what he's going to say. That nothing is going to leave or be taken out of Torah from start to finish. Somebody will say, well, how is the Yod being the 10th letter? How does that represent a start? I'll tell you. The Yod represents the beginning of the ex ex exhibition of power. You already read the idea of he's upholding all things by his power and his hand how about this? Isaiah 53, verse 1. You all know that one by heart. You just don't know you know it, but you know it by heart. Read it. Who has believed our report? Who has believed our report? Come on. And to whom is the arm of the Lord is the Lord? Yahweh is the Lord. It all starts there. You gotta if, if if you haven't believed the report, and if you haven't seen his work, if he hasn't revealed that to you, ain't no hope for you. The journey begins when you see the arm of Yah. And if if if, if the yo he, 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 really huh. fight, he started a war fight here, right? How much years after and just kinda of straight back to Exodus when he was right in the arm, right in the ten wood, and this is the Beautiful. So we see the hand we all gave. Now watch this. How many commandments? No, no, let's go before the commandments. Just a minute, baby. We're almost done. Before the commandments, our people were in captivity. Yah said, I rose up Pharaoh. So that I could show my what? Power. And then he gave how many plagues? Ten. A number for you. He delivers us his mighty right hand. Then he <laughs> You can see it, huh? Make you get happy, man. Start shouting over here, boy. And then he said, I'll deliver you out with my. And when he went to the mountain. He gave Moses how many commandments from the mountain? Yeah. Which would represent his righteousness in power. That's how his people would then live. So when he says one yod, one, one yod, 
Why? Because yoke represents power, authority, judgment, and law. Not the smallest thing. The biggest thing. Not one judgment of Yah. Woo. Now. Um, oh. Also. The idea of ten represents also the idea of being holy because remember from the Feast of Trumpets to the Day of Atonement is 10 days. The first letter of Yah's name is a what? Yod. The first letter of Yehoshua's name, the first letter of Yisrael, the first letter of Jerusalem. <laughs> Power, authority, might. And the next word is even, well, I'm gonna say deeper, but it's just as deep. Write this down. The English word, they say tittle. The Hebrew word, it's not tittle, it's tag. They tried to do what's called a transliteration. It's, it's tav gimel. And it literally means to strike or to touch or to strike. It also has to do with to shine because it's related to this word. Kuf, resh, huh? Ko, I'm sorry. What, am I right? Mm -hmm. well, I, what I say, kof, kuf. Which one do you want, sun on horizon or hand? I'm talking about sun on horizon. <laughs> okay, kof. and the idea of kof has to do with uh, this particular word has to do with the idea of shining. So when you combine to touch and to strike with the idea of rays of light or horns, you get this idea of the mighty power of Yah that's going to strike and push or destroy his enemies. So you've got the Yod, which represents the power. You've got the Tag, which represents his horns. So when he says, before one Yod or one Tag, before one judgment, before one act of power, before one promise of judgment, and before, before he does not do what he says he's gonna do, his reputation will be over and all y'all be dead. <laughs> do y'all, are you following the moray? It's understanding going out worldwide that this is not dealing with something little, it's huge. This idea of always trying to give a physical rep representation of what Yah says as far as a description and not seeing the function. When you see an ox and he's got long horns and he's charging you, uh, it's best you get out the way. <laughs> Why? Because if you don't, you're dead. And he's like this, if you think that the power of Yah is not going to accomplish what he says he's going to do, he's going to kill the world literally with his horns of light. And therefore, light then has to do with striking someone. Oh, come on, more, You're taking this thing way too far. Am I really? Anybody read Acts, I believe, chapter 9? where Saul was on his way to Damascus 
Can somebody please find that for me? I didn't write that verse down. I need the exact verse. Let's see if he's ever hit somebody with rays. <coughs> Uh, okay, come on. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from Shamayim. What? What? And what happened? And he fell to the earth. Wait, light did light shine. <laughs> and and what happened to him? And he fell to wait, the wait, earth. wait, wait! Come on, now that's a grown man, right? I done been outside many times. Light shine ain't never knocked me down. <laughs> what knocked him down? According to this text, not my words, the light was so powerful, it literally knocked him on the ground. It was a small, small exhibition of the power of Yah's light. Can I say this? Of his horns. Because later, in that same conversation that Paul has with the Messiah, the Messiah says, you do know it's hard to kick against the pricks. In other words, that pointy end, I already knocked you down. So you're going to keep going or I'll have to kill you. So you see, the Messiah is not playing. This idea of him talking about jot or tittle, the smallest thing in the I don't know what he's talking about. Now, now let's read it in context, because I'm done, basically. He says, For verily I say unto you, in, till heaven and earth pass, not one yod or one tag shall in no wise pass from the law. Wait, no wise? No, no, till it's all going to be fulfilled. Look, everything in there is going to be fulfilled. You can bank on it. Because he said truly, or he said amen, which is to say it's for sure. Everything. You mean, you mean, uh, 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 our enemies being defeated? Everything. You mean being gathered back to side? Everything. Lions laying down by land? Everything. What about people eating swine uh, <laughs> under the tree <laughs> in Isaiah 66? Everything. We're going to learn our language. Everything. He's going to, what about getting us back from the four corners of the, of, the, of the earth where we've been scattered? Everything. Everything. Everything is going to happen. Therefore, whosoever shall break one. So I was talking to Huda earlier today about this word break. In Greek, it's 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 louo. And it literally means just to loose or to undo. But in Hebrew, the word is par'ah. And the idea is to break or to violate. And the idea behind this word break has to do with uh, mouth, pay, ah, resh, head, but here we have two R's, so it's pay, resh, resh, which would be P-R-R, -R, I guess, if you were to spell it in English. And pay, in this sense, represents the mouth of an ox. And the idea that, and it's kind of interesting how this word came to mean um, break, because the idea is that an ox would, then, would walk up on heads of grain to bust them open and so that's where the word par comes from and the idea it was actually a positive word in the beginning because that's how you got your seed in order to live for substance but when it became par i mean uh pay resh resh then you have another head of a man so it's the idea now of man trampling the seed of Yah or man trampling the word of Yah because you know word is seed in the Bible so when man tramples the seed of Yah under his feet that is when he's breaking Yah's laws 
Not when he does something wrong, because everybody does something wrong. When you do something wrong, you simply go to the text and fix it. But when you say, I'm done with it, I'm not under the law at all. Matter of fact, I step on the Torah, I crush it under my feet. He said, you do that and teach other people to do it? Because the word there for, for uh, I think it says commandment in English, whosoever breaks one of these commandments in English, the word there in Hebrew is Torah. You break Torah and then turn around and teach people? Oh my goodness gracious. You're going to hell. Least in the kingdom means you go to hell. The greatest in the kingdom reign with Yah. The least in the kingdom burn in hell. That's the Hebrew thought. That's just the way it is. I don't have no other way to explain it other than that. The least in the kingdom is not the homeless. If you get in the gate and you're homeless and you're not in hell, you should clap. <laughs> <laughs> the least in the kingdom are those burning in Gehenna, which would be the garbage dump of heaven, if you please. That's the least. All right. Now, he says, whosoever shall break this and teach man, well, I don't have time with that, because that's a whole other story. You know, some people will accidentally break one of Yah's laws, but feel terrible about it and go to the text, ask for repentance, and whatever the text says to make up for that violation, they will do it. Why? Because they love Yah and they keep his commandments, which they guard them with their life. That means if I do anything that violates them at all, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to straighten it out. Why? Because I don't want to live like that. But you have other people who want to break his commandments and then teach other people to do it. Eating pigs, shellfish, all that other kind of craziness. Celebrating all kind of pagan days and holidays. Following all kind of weird rituals and things like that that's not in Torah. Now, you personally do it, but you don't feel good about another brother saying, I don't want to do it. So you're going to now teach a person lawlessness. So he begins his message by honestly, watch this, attacking false teachers. He said, before I even start really tackling everybody else, I'm going to deal with these teachers. All these fellas up here, they're going to hell. That's basically what he's saying. When he says, if you break the least of these, oh, by the way, that word least, I'm going to go fast now. Y'all can look up these Hebrew words later, but I'll just give it to you. The word for least does not mean smallest in the sense of unimportant. It has to do with the small finger on your hand. It's your pinky. Now, would you say that your pinky is worthless? <laughs> No, it just happens to be according to your ten fingers. It just simply be the, the smallest one, but it ain't worthless. So, in how many commandments do we have? So he's talking again about if you break one, teaching break one, and then teach other people to do it. Hula said it's the same picture, and it is. When when we talk about the fingers, you also have toes. So your toes obviously are, are, are 10 too. So you also have small toes. And she was talking to me earlier. She said, you do know like if you lose your pinky toe, you can't walk. She said the balance is in that. So you have to, would have to learn how to walk all over again. In other words, small to the Hebrew does not mean insignificant. <laughs> So when they when they when you read your when you read your commentaries and they say it means that if you break even the most smallest most insignificant law, Yah don't have no insignificant laws. There's only greater law and lesser law, but they're all significant. In other words, it is worse for you to kill a person, right? Then to not help a person get his ox out the di ditch. But they're both Torah. And that's what he's going to be doing, Yeshua, for the rest of his time in Matthew, in the, in the sermon. That's what he's going to be doing, straightening out all that stuff. You've heard it said, don't, com don't uh, murder. I'm telling you, murder starts in the heart. When you hate a person and all that, that's what you need to stop. He doesn't say, 
it's okay to murder. No, what he's doing is saying, when I wrote this, what I was really trying to get you to do was stop hating your brother in your heart first because that's what leads to murder. All right. Uh, yeah. The last word I'll give you is whosoever shall do them. I'll give you the word for do. It's the word ash. Ash. How you say it? How you say it? Yeah. And that literally means to work or to do. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The laws were not given to just look at. They were given to do. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 1. I'm going to hit that one online real quick. Don't want no Hebrew to miss this. Now these are the commandments, statutes, and judgments which Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded to teach you that you might, here it is, do. People say, I like learning the Bible. Okay, but do you like doing what is that? <laughs> you learn about Passover, but do you keep Passover? Are you doing Passover? You learn about the dietary law, but are you doing it? All right, so I, I think you guys got my point on that one. All right, so he ends with this, and I'll end with it. I'm going to end with this too. He said, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of Shamaim. Now, watch this. Since I gave you the word Shamaim, having a root word of Shem, which means the character or the very breath or the wind of Yah, then the kingdom of Yah then represents those who are aligned with his character. The kingdom of heaven is those who are lining up with the character of Yah. If you want to be Gadol in the kingdom, which the word there is, man, write it down. Gadol is the word they translate it into great. And the word literally has to do with a rope that has many, many strands. So you have a thin rope. You try to pick up something on just one little strand, boom, it snaps. But you add another strand and another strand and another strand onto the rope and you keep twisting it and it gets bigger. The bigger the rope gets, the greater it is and the more useful it is in, in lifting things, right? So in the kingdom of Yah, ooh, I feel a shout, I gotta stop that. In the kingdom of Yah, part of our job is to help lift our brother, help lift our sister, to help lift Yisrael, to lift the name of Yah. But if you're a good doll, as one little strand, and you like just, you know, you have weakness, you have nothing because you have no commandments, there's nothing to you, in other words. We used to have a term like that that says, you know, that person has a lot to them. And it meant that there's substance there. A person breaking Yah's laws, no substance there. They can't help nobody. They can't lift no one. That word also means, the, the gimel means to lift. You can't lift anyone if you are in constant violation of Torah. But as soon as you say, no, I'm going to start keeping Torah. I'm going to start walking and keeping the commandments, and I'm going to start teaching my brothers to do so. He says, you'll be Godot. In other words, your reputation among other people may not be all that. But among those who are called by his name, well, you'd be great. To the world, you're a slave, you're poor, you're sorry, you ain't nothing. To Yah, he's somebody I can use to help lift up. She's somebody I can use to help lift my people. Hallelujah. 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 In his own words, he said, I didn't come here to destroy the law, to abolish it, to be done with it. I don't even want your brain to begin to think like that, which would cause you to, be, to start acting like that. No, I came to complete the sentence of Yah that he started in Genesis and it will be completed in the Revelation. I came to fill up all the voids. I came to chop away all that man-made stuff to reestablish the stuff that people took out. Why? Because the reputation of Yah is on the line and the life of man is on the line. 
and the power of Yah and the rays of Yah are going to, his promises, his judgments are going to be in effect whether you like it or not. So teach people that they can anything less than that, then you ain't nothing in the kingdom. But keep those commandments and teach people to keep them. Then you'll be Gadol, a strong rope that can be used to help lift up Yisrael. Hallelujah. To the 12 tribes of Yisrael, I pray uh, that something was said that gave you some encouragement on the island of Trinidad. Trinidad. <laughs> Y'all say shalom. 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 shalom.